Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to welcome to the Jim Cornette Experience today at not only one of the greatest managers of all time, but also a successful wrestler, a booker, office personnel. He's done everything. I'm sure he's probably, if he hadn't put up a ring, he's probably built one from scratch. The inimitable, former spiritual leader of the Four Horsemen and all-around uh, Hall of Famer, J.J. Dillon. J.J., thank you for being here. Jim, this is my pleasure. I always enjoy when we have opportunities like this just to sit down and have conversation. Well, you know, we we actually got a chance a couple of weekends ago to sit down in, at the Legends of the Ring uh, convention in New Jersey. You came from a, from an appearance in Texas, and you, and you weren't able to make the convention, but we shot a video for our friends at Kayfabe Commentaries. Uh, it's the new line of uh of videos that they're going to be releasing imminently back to the territories where i sit down with someone who was an integral part of of one of the territories in the old days and we got a chance to talk about one of our favorite places uh charlotte north carolina jim crockett promotions and you were able to address it not only as a wrestler because that was the territory that you went uh your first full-time job as a pro wrestler in uh the early 70s you worked there for quite a while and then came back in the 80s and not only managed the Four Horsemen, but also uh, was an assistant to Dusty uh, Rhodes as Booker. And we covered that uh, for the Back to the Territories release on Jim Crocker Promotions, which, by the way, our friends at Kayfabe Commentaries, you can look these things up at shootinterviews.com. That's shootinterviews.com uh, for all your shoot interviews needs, uh, not only the Timeline series and the You Shoot series, but this they even built us a set. Sean Oliver who is, he's so tight, he's tighter than the skin on a hot dog, folks, but he spent some money on this set uh, for this series that, that really looked great, and we had, a, we had a great time reminiscing about the, the glory days of the Charlotte Territory, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the finished product. I know you are too, J.J. Yeah, we even had chairs. I mean, it was... Uh, it yes, was really we, had, we had chairs, we had a podium, they even had lights for us. They had a background. We had the, the logo that I'm sure Universal Pictures will probably sue them over, uh, which was very reminiscent of the Back to the Future movies. But, uh, but we, the, yeah, they, they really rolled out uh, the red carpet and spared almost uh, every expense. But no, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. But, but, you know, all, all kidding aside, that I've, I've done a lot of interviews, but that was one of the more enjoyable ones for me because it – it, it is very close to me as to where I started, as you mentioned, as a wrestler. And then a decade later came back uh, when Dusty came in and, you know, had to start and build it. And then was just the right place at the right time, kind of the pinnacle of my career with the four horsemen. And, and at the same time, um, you know, we spent a lot of time together because the midnight express were red, red hot and, and sort of the formula of success there. And, so we really had a lot to talk about, and it was a very, very interesting conversation. I think the fans will really enjoy it. Well, we, we talked about the rise of the original Jim Crockett promotions, which dates all the way back to the 30s uh, when Jim Crockett Sr. moved from Bristol, Tennessee to Charlotte and, and started his promotion that would encompass not only pro wrestling but also concerts and the Harlem Globetrotters and um, minor league baseball. And just, you know, he was really the preeminent uh, entertainment promoter for quite some time in, in the state of North Carolina. And then we covered when, when the territory reinvented itself after his death, when uh, George Scott and John Ringley, who were running the company at the time, brought uh, Johnny Valentine and Wahoo McDaniel in, made it a singles territory from tag team territory. And then we covered when it was reinvented again and, and just exploded in popularity in the 80s with the advent of of Starcade in Greensboro and, and Dusty's, you know, just his amazing big picture uh, ideas for things. And it, it was really at that point, uh, I, I, I don't want to give away too much because Sean then will get mad at us and say, why'd you give away the store? But we talked about the fact that uh, this is in interesting to me, Jim Crockett Promotions, not WCW under Turner Broadcasting in the 90s, but Jim Crockett Promotions, we made the case, was the only wrestling promotion that ever almost kicked Vince McMahon and the WWF's ass uh, because uh, WCW in the 90s uh, under Turner Broadcasting, they did great ratings and they were doing mega business for a short period of time. But Vince was so well established and we always knew that eventually, just because of the organization and the people behind it and the way it was run, 
that the WWF was going to win that war, even if Vince didn't realize it. But in the 80s, uh, Vince had just started out in 84 with the, the national expansion, and it was neck and neck, both in terms of TV ratings and in terms of house show gates. Um, I say that the uh, Jim Crockett promotions of the 80s was the only wrestling promotion that ever really stood a chance of, of taking the WWF down, and, and we made a pretty good case for that, I thought. I, I, I totally agree with you, and it just goes to show you of the power of television. And once the, uh, that national exposure kicked in, both with syndication and then that show that was on TBS every Saturday afternoon at 6.05 for, what, 28 years that show ran, and wrestling fans are creatures of habit, as you know, no matter where you go in the world, and people uh, plan their weekends to be home in front of that TV at 6.05, and um, it went everywhere, and it really it made us not only national stars, but international stars. Well, and also for for the folks who buy that line that Raw is the longest running action adventure program. Well, I guess the you know because wrestling wasn't an action adventure program, wrestling was wrestling. But uh, the Saturday Night TBS show ran for twenty eight years. Uh, Houston wrestling and Portland wrestling made it to almost forty years. So Raw's got a little ways to go. But yeah, let's... and if we if we ever could sit down and and put a stopwatch on actual wrestling content <laughs> uh, i think we will we, we will safely be into uh the next century before they ever catch up to us yeah yeah well and and now if we did that now the pyro ballyhoo guy would get hot at us because then we'd just be marks that and, and we'd be stupid because we're we're talking about fake matches on a fake program uh, that's his viewpoint of it. But of course, you know, that's the, that's the way he did things. Uh, he, he had fake matches on fake programs. We had real matches on a real program cause ours actually drew and made sense. But nevertheless, um, today I want to talk about a few things with you that we didn't get a chance to talk to cause the subject or talk about the subject was Jim Crockett promotions, but you've been so many different places and, and you did something that I envy you. And that's worked for and under and learned from the legendary Eddie Graham, who not only was the, the, the guru behind championship wrestling from Florida, but who taught so many of, of the great bookers and, and great stars. Jack Briscoe was a personal protege of his. Dusty Rhodes learned from him. Kevin Sullivan learned from him. Bill Watts learned from him. Why? I mean, for for the younger fans, those who don't know the genius of this guy, tell us a little bit about why Eddie Graham is so universally respected amongst folks who were in the business then, and why he had such say in in pretty much the entire industry. Well, boy, I you know I'm sitting here looking at a the first issue of Wrestling Review, which uh, wonder where you got that. I got it from a real good friend of mine. His name is Jim Barnett. <laughs> and uh, I've been wanting to get, I had a copy at one time and let it go and and really regretted it. But on the cover was Dr. Jerry Graham and Eddie Graham. And it was in 1959. And they were, I mean, they just were unbelievably over in in the New York uh, territory, which is really all I knew. That, that I was born and raised in New Jersey. So to me, that was wrestling, the only thing that I knew. And Jerry Graham was the more flamboyant. He was the one that was just over the top. And you didn't hear too much from Eddie. And it was only years later that I you know, found out that really Eddie was uh, the driving force behind it in terms of making things happen, uh, the creative side of it, uh, the psychology of everything. And Jerry was the one that just uh, drew all the attention. But Eddie ended up in Florida. Uh, he, lo he loved the weather down there and loved fishing and boating and flew his own airplane. And uh, he was a man's man. And as you've already said, he, he had such an influence on, I think, everybody that, that came, came in contact with him. And I, you know, I said after looking back over 40 years in the business, he was, I call him my mentor, the, the one single person that had the greatest impact on me because you, you didn't have to engage in conversation and seek out 
uh, answers to questions. All you had to do was just sit there and listen. And he had a, about a seventh grade education, but he was uh, uh, he was a professor when it came to the wrestling profession and understanding the logic and what what we were trying to accomplish every given night when that when that bell rang and as far as at, at that, in those days it was one hour of television so that hour was was critical to the success of the business because that went everywhere in the state of Florida. And the the challenge was that you had to have that balance between the live event. And, and again, it was weekly shows, which was a, a big adjustment for me coming from the New York area where, you know, the garden ran every third week and the major towns in these big population centers would run mega events every third week. And Tampa was every Tuesday night in, in that armory. So, what you did on television had to point towards what you were going to do on that Tuesday night. And then whatever you did that Tuesday night, you produced a television show the next day. And it really was an episodic uh, athletic soap opera. And he, uh, he just, I, I, it's hard to, hard to put into words. And I've tried to think about it as the years have gone by. And I think we may have talked about it a little bit in our conversation that, Eddie spent a lot of time in Amarillo and he was around Dory Funk Sr. And I only met Sr. one time, but I think there is kind of a, a sharing of knowledge over the years of really, really knowledgeable people, maybe not book learned or in terms of the diplomas they held, but they had their doctorate degrees in the world of professional wrestling. And I, I think the influence of Dory Funk Sr., with his two sons, only two brothers have ever been world champion. And as you mentioned too, uh, uh, they went into Florida, worked a lot. Bill Watts had a tremendous run in Florida and Eddie had a lot to do with that. He, he, and he was not someone who was very verbose and, and outspoken. And he was, he was very subtle. He would just, kind of pull up a chair and not even be the center of attention, kind of like a little bit outside the circle. And then before you know it, everybody in the circle kind of cocked their head a little bit and twisted their chair around. And without him even trying all of that, that wisdom and knowledge just came pouring out of him. And it did influence Dusty and it influenced Bill Watson. It influenced Jody Hamilton. Uh, it influenced uh, me greatly. And I think that just spread throughout the business because as these people went elsewhere, you know, that knowledge that they picked up from Eddie went with them. And well, and Dory Funk senior uh, came uh, even a little bit before Eddie Graham and, and Dory Funk senior was a, a very powerful guy in the NWA. Uh, his power was bigger than his territory. The Amarillo territory was never a huge territory in terms of uh the attention it got it was big geographically but in terms of the attention it got it wasn't a uh, carolinas it wasn't the northeast it, it it was a smaller territory but that was the one that dory funk senior had homesteaded and he trained a lot of top guys he, i mean he even had a, a japanese influence when baba the the first thing he did when he got a a young guy he wanted to hand the baton off to uh, jumbo saruta was to send him to amarillo uh, I think uh, some of the other Japanese young boys trained there. And Dory Funk Sr. had a great influence over who the NWA champion would be. A lot of the other, the bigger promoters, the bigger territories, they deferred to Dory Funk Sr. And later on, they would defer to Eddie Graham. Uh, Eddie was pretty much, I guess you'd know better, but was was one of the decision makers as to who would get the the biggest prize in the business, which was the NWA World Championship. That's how well thought of he was. Uh, uh, amongst a bunch of promoters that a lot of times couldn't agree on what to have for lunch, right? Yeah, and 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 I agree with you. I think Dory Senior also uh, uh, did have a lot of influence. And I was there in Amarillo when Jumbo came in and was basically groomed. And they had a, a an arrangement where they booked talent for uh, the Japan tours with All Japan that was owned by Baba. And at that point. Business in Japan was flourishing. Ricky Dozan, who started pro wrestling, had had passed away, 
and who his two top stars were Antonio Noki and Giant Baba, and they both split and started their own promotions. And both of them enjoyed great success, and Oki with New Japan and Baba with All Japan. And Dory Sr. Uh, set up an arrangement for sending American talent over there. So that was kind of an, uh, you know, a little carrot that got dangled out in front of you when you talked about coming to Amarillo. And as you said, geographically, uh, you had some long trips, but the talent that, that was there at any given time is like the who's who of our business. And if you knew, if you went there, there was uh, a, a, a great chance. My first time there, I was there a year and a month and um, made two tours of, of Japan, which was one of my dreams to, to go and to go to Japan. And another guy that came in while I was there, who really was a big star here was, uh, was Haku who was sumo and along with barbarian, they came from the Isle of Tonga and then were the only two that survived, uh, and stayed and went into professional wrestling. And then the funks brought Haku from Japan to kind of learn the American style of wrestling. And I was in Amarillo when he, when he arrived, poor guy arrived in the Denver airport lost his wallet, lost everything. I mean, it, but he went on to be a huge, huge uh, star in our business. You know, there's there's a famous story of, of, and this is really an indication of how to get a stipulation match over. Dory Funk Sr. is the guy who invented the Texas death match and the rules that now nobody even knows what the rules of the original Texas death match were. It's been prostituted so much, but basically it was the idea of appealing to those West Texas rednecks. We're going to have a fight and we're going to go until somebody can't fight anymore. There's no pinfalls. There's no disqualifications. There's no stopping for blood. If a man is pinned, he has a 30 second rest period. If he answers the bell, the match continues. It can go four falls or 40 and Dory Funk senior and cyclone Negro actually put that on the map by doing the famous match that went 44 falls in an hour and 45 minutes. And both of them went to the hospital for three days afterwards. And, and part of it was a work and part of it was a shoot, just blood loss and exhaustion, probably in the West Texas heat. Uh, that's the way you got to match over. And w- were you there? I've heard this and, and I, I, I feel it's true, but you can tell firsthand when they would have a Texas death match, they would book that as the only match on the card. And they would say, we're going to have standby matches in case the Texas death match doesn't go two hours, but that was the selling point uh, to, to settle a feud once and for all. Did you see any of those wild ass matches and, and, and what stands out in your mind as, as some of the great ones? Yeah, I think a little bit later on, uh, and that may have been the case at one time the, that it was the only match on the card. And, uh, but it's the, it's a concept that's very, um, typical to that area. I mean, they're, they're hardworking people. Um, you know, when they worked the cattle, they, they worked the oil fields and they were blue collar people. And it, as you've already pointed out, you didn't have the huge population centers. I, I haven't looked at a map recently, but I want to say Amarillo was maybe 125,000 people, 150,000 people. And you were there every week. So it was important that you maintain that momentum. And as we've talked about often, when things are going well, it's like you, you, everything goes well. You can't, you can't do anything wrong. And if you do something silly or something that insults the intelligence to people or something that's not logical and you lose them, uh, you know, it's like going down a slippery slope, like an avalanche. And then boy, you, to get them back, uh, is, is really, really tough. So it, it's hard to put the brakes on an avalanche. Yes. And so I met Dory senior one time, actually, before I ever went to Amarillo, he, Dory, Dory, Dory junior was the world champion and came in to defend the title while I was in Crocker promotions in the mid Atlantic area, uh, in Greensboro and senior came in to team with Terry Funk and I met Terry and senior. And it was the only time I met senior. And when I left, uh, no, that next summer and went to the Canadian Maritimes while I was in the Maritimes is when, uh, senior passed away. So I, 
feel very fortunate that I did have a chance to to meet him and uh, just I, I can see in my own mind that 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 wealth of knowledge that that flowed through senior with his with his sons with Eddie Graham and and I, I count Bob Geigel in that mix too. Geigel was uh, very close to, to to senior and a lot of his philosophy and which is probably spilled over to Harley Race. So. Um, you know, it's like uh, a spider web when you start looking at the center of it and and, and kind of follow all the pieces that go out. Uh, you know, you can understand and you see towards the center and, and you see Senior and you see Eddie Graham. And uh, I, I just feel so fortunate that I came into the business at a time when I could be around an Eddie Graham and be around a Bill Watts and had the opportunity to work with Dusty, who a lot of times gets maligned and gets a bad rap as not having been a great mind. And some call him an egomaniac. And yes, of course, Dusty did have an ego, but I've also pointed out that I think having an ego and you see this in, in, in the music business, you see it in other sports, uh, having an ego is in many ways part of the makeup of somebody who's successful. It, it's well, just a it, matter of controlling it, that ego. Yeah, you, you, Mick Jagger probably has a high opinion of himself, um, as, as maybe uh, uh, so might Brad Pitt. But if you're gonna if you're gonna be a star, you may can get away with not having an ego. If you're gonna be a superstar, you got to have an ego because that's yeah. part of the drive of somebody like that to prove that they're the best and. Uh, Kevin Sullivan's told me the story about Eddie Graham that he would give these because you mentioned that Dory Funk Sr., uh, small uh, population centers having to come back every week. Everything had to be logical and fall in place. The same thing applied in Florida. Weekly events, especially back in the 60s and 70s, the population wasn't what it was today. Everything had to make sense. An athletic soap opera wasn't the soap opera that we hear and see today where everybody's talking about these contrived uh, illogical, uh, uh, could never happen in a million years scenarios where everybody's, just, you know, oh, you shot my dog and cooked it in a pie and whatever. Uh, it was, it was all about the matches and the finishes and the personalities, the things that happened. And Eddie Graham was a master of finishes. Kevin would say he'd give a guy or two guys a five minute finish. Here's exactly what I want you to do. And there would be things in there that would tease what had been done three or four weeks beforehand, and but it would backfire this time. And there would be something that would tease what was going to happen next week and the moves and the way that things happened. And, and then finally, the guys would go out and execute that five-minute finish and bring the house down, and they'd come back. And Eddie Graham's comment would be, where was the third drop kick? Because <laughs> yeah, he was that meticulous, and and that's that's something that's been lost also. That in a finish now, it's like what moves can we get in rather than what makes sense to do with where we're going, and that's why Eddie Graham was a, was a master at finishes. And the other part of it too was that you didn't you, you, the fans were never mad at the referee because <clears throat> the referee had a job. <clears throat> which was basically to be in there and call it like he saw it. And as long as the referee looked like he was doing his best and not part of what was happening, um, the referees maintained their level of respect. And if the outcome of the match wasn't favorable to the fans, they weren't mad at the referee. They were mad at somebody that did something underhanded like, Jim Cornette whacking somebody with a tennis racket. Yeah, they, they were. Imagine that they were mad at the heel, and that and that's obviously where Bill Watts. I personally watched Bill Watts find guys for burying the referee, and then he'd find the referee for allowing himself to be buried. Because yeah. if and it goes it, on the referee, like, then it goes on the promotion as well. Because the referee is is a representative of the promotion. He's the official. He's supposed to keep order. Uh, and, and, and you didn't want heat on the promotion because then the people, instead of saying, I want to pay to see that guy finally get his, they'd say, well, why am I supporting this promotion? It allows these crooked people to be involved with it. That's right. And when the referee's instructions were, you count. And if a guy's shoulders don't come up by the count of three, your job is to count three, regardless of what your understanding is of what you thought might, might, might take place. And it was the responsibility of whoever was in that match to not have your shoulder down at three. 
And if the, if you left the shoulder down and the referee didn't count three, then it did bury the referee. It lost your credibility. There was no logic to it. Uh, and things like that just did, didn't happen. And if the heel manager interfered in the match in front of the referee and the referee didn't disqualify his charge because that was not supposed to be the finish, then the heat was the heat with at least Eddie Graham or Bill Watts or anybody knew what they were doing as a promoter was on the manager for fucking up and burying the referee. Yep, absolutely. And that's why we learned to be sneaky and quick. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, you know, that that's once again, these little pieces of logic that make perfect sense have been lost because I think and tell me what you think. Everybody in the business now, whether it be the wrestlers or the referees or the promoters or the, now they call them writers instead of bookers, but they approach the wrestling industry as a show that they're putting on rather than as something that is supposed to be taken as legitimate. And when it was approached as something that was supposed to be taken as legitimate, they would look at the, at the overall presentation from the viewpoint of the guy up there in the bleachers who's looking and saying, wow, all those moves look great, but that wouldn't really happen. Why would that, why would he disqualify somebody? Why would he do this? Why would he do that? It, if it doesn't make sense to the guy that's just sitting there and has paid his 10 bucks for his wrestling ticket and wants to see something that makes sense to him, that immediately smacks them in the face, the fans, but the, the, the people in the business don't look at it the, these days that way because they're approaching it as a show rather than as a, a conflict that is being presented as, as legitimate. You're absolutely right. And there's two points that I, I would like to make. No, number one, we go again, go back when you were in Amarillo every uh, Thursday night, when you were in Tampa every Tuesday night, uh, in Miami every Wednesday night and, and Kansas City every Thursday, wherever you happen to be. And again, without those huge population centers, those nuances and those attentions to, to detail were not only important, they were critical because you couldn't afford to have anybody that would had bought a ticket to be alienated because of something stupid that you did and said, oh, you know, I'm not going to come back and pay to watch this next week. So you had something at stake. And I think that's part of the problem, too, now where they go to these towns and oftentimes they might not come back, depending on the size of the town, for three months, six months, sometimes even a year. So the importance of not doing anything stupid isn't as important because if it does, it's like, oh, well, you know, maybe when we come back in, in three months or six months, you know, they'll have forgotten. So well, and it, the takes a lot of, also... it takes a lot of pressure off of, uh, off the guys where we had that pressure on us that we, we could not afford because that's how we made our living. And the other point, because I don't want to forget about it, is that there were titles and titles that meant something. And that's what we were shooting for. And that's been lost as well. They, they, um, they, 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 they had too many titles and the titles that they do have don't mean anything. Well, the, the, in any professional sport, the idea, the goal, the, the, the summit of the mountain is to become the champion. And that's the, that is ingrained in people. Anytime they're watching anything that's that's presented as a sport, anything from horse racing to football to baseball, who's going to be the champions? Who's going to win the pennant? Who's going to win the series? Whatever, that's that's the goal. And and that's a natural thing for people to understand and understand easily. And that's why that the wrestling championships were just as important in wrestling as any other championship was in, in any other particular sport. And when it's used as a prop or it's devalued or it's switched back and forth, just, you know, willy nilly, as they say, um, then it, it gradually loses a meaning. And then, you know, what's more important than being the best in the world at what you do? If you lose the, the, the prize, then you lose the importance of the chase. True. And, and the logic, too, goes one step further in that the fans can understand that as the champion – you're financially rewarded by the fact that, that you wear the belt, that you at that time are the best. And so you're going to earn more money. And that's very logical. To, well, to remember when the announcers, when the announcers used to say, and Eddie, boy, he'll get the winner's share of the purse. 
The winners yeah, made absolutely. more than the losers. Main event made more than first match. That was the whole idea behind people being able to say in, in the wrestling business, well, no, nobody's going to tell me whether to win or lose because the winner makes more money. Okay, we can understand that. Yes. And, and But now the writers basically get the same check every week, <laughs> whether they write good shit or bad shit. Whereas it, it, in, in those days, the bookers, a lot of times were on a percentage. We talked with Ole Anderson. I talked to him in Charlotte, and we've mentioned this on the program. Ole Anderson, when he was booking uh, Atlanta for Jim Barnett, had two or three percent of the towns. And that two or three percent, along with his main event wrestling pay, added up to where Ole in the late 70s was making uh, better than 250 grand a year, which translates to about 750 grand, according to Psychedelic Alice's uh, whiz computer, about $750,000 today. So big money in wrestling was not invented recently. But uh, but to do that, you had to get the towns up. Jerry Lawler had 10% of Memphis. If he drew a thirty-five dollars or $40,000 house uh, uh, wrestling the world champion on a Monday night, he got $3,500 or $4,000 for that one night's work. People wonder why he never left Memphis. Um, and now it's, it's you know, the, the guaranteed contracts for not only the, the wrestlers, but also more importantly for the, for the writers slash matchmakers slash bookers, they eliminate a lot of that, you know, boy, we better do something. We better do it good. Yeah. And, and also part of the problem with the current product is that, uh, that everything is gray. You don't have definitive black and white. And I'm not talking racially. Of course, I'm, I'm just talking about white hat, black hat. Yeah. White hat, black hat. Very good. And, uh, and today uh, you don't have that uh, definitive identification and the fans, you know, that's what the fans, you know, their favorites, they wanted to support them. They wanted to see them win. They cheered for them. And when they were uh, being hurt, they felt the pain with them. And when they fought back and were victorious, the fans would blow the roof off the house. There was a, a, a lot of emotion in the match that, tr- that transferred to the audience. And it was just a, a magical time to be in the business to, uh, to, to really to be a part of that. Well, you know, and, and also I, I want to segue to, to talking about Dusty, but we got to mention – you, you touched on it. Everybody, well, Dusty had an ego and, and, and the Dusty finish. And we know the Dusty finish was actually an Eddie Graham finish. And the problem became the only thing I've ever said about Dusty a, a negative on his booking is that some, he, he, like everybody else, he went to the well once too often or a few times too often, especially as television expanded from the territorial system to national where everybody saw every, the, the same thing at the same time. But one referee gets wiped out, and the babyface wins the title. But the second referee coming in to count the pin, the first referee had seen the man thrown over the top rope, whatever the case. A lot of Dusty's finishes came from Eddie Graham, naturally, as they would, because when you steal from one person, it's plagiarism. When you steal from many, it's research. And if you're going to steal, steal from the smartest guy in the room. But the first time that those finishes were done in front of any given audience They worked, they sold out, they did great return business because people had not seen them before. And unfortunately, as finishes were redone because they worked and television became national and everybody was seeing something at the same time, that finish that could never happen in a million years, but oh my God, it happened and I can't wait to see what's going to happen next. All of a sudden it happened three times in three years. And then more often, and that's when the finishes started getting devalued because people were like, okay, I can buy that that happened once in a lifetime. They they had a double knockout finish in a UFC fight, the double punch finish. They they had one in an MMA fight. It was several years ago, but they had it. It can happen, but it can't happen every month. Yeah. I mean, there's, I don't think there's anything that's, ever original that that hasn't been done and i and i could go back to the i can go back to the 60s uh back in the northeast the bruno was a champion at the time kowalski was the top challenger and you know they were going all around the territory and they were in the in the uh, in the boston garden and i had just had a handful of matches i was 
mainly a referee and people didn't even know that I, that I'd done any, any wrestling at all. But a lot of those matches had a, uh, um, a series to them. They would have a match that would end up in a, in a DQ or something. And then they'd come back with no DQ and then it'd end up a count out or something. And then the third match, they, you know, they'd kind of box it in where it had to be something definitive. And Bruno Kowalski had three sellouts in the garden in Boston, the Boston garden. And it was like, boy, you know, God, there's, there's gotta be some way, but you know, they boxed themselves in where, and I don't know if they, they don't, I don't know if they called it the Texas death match, but there must be a winner, no disqualification, no count out. There must be a winner. And I got a call from Arnold Scrollin and the way it played out is I was came to Boston as a, as a referee, um, the fans up there didn't know me, weren't accustomed to seeing me. And after a really, really tough fought match, uh, I, I'm not sure which one went out on the floor and got a chair and threw it in the ring, but one of them had the chair and was stalking the other and kind of going around in a circle. And I'm going around in a circle as well. And Kowalski, I think had the chair and Bruno then stepped in across my path where now we're in a row at the same time as Kowalski let fly with the chair, Bruno ducked, wham, I got hit with the chair down. I went, I, I staggered up, knocked out on my feet, you know, blood coming down my face. And I kind of went around in a walking dead circle and everybody could see that uh, I was knocked out standing up and then I collapsed. And then Walter Kowalski and Bruno went to Fifth City. The dressing rooms emptied. All of the the guys from the one side grabbed Bruno and, and physically had to drag him back. And all of the guys from the other side had to drag Kowalski back. I lay motionless in the ring. They bring the paramedics. They bring a stretcher, put me on the stretcher, and take me back to the dressing room. That's the last match of the night. And the match where there must be a winner. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no disqualification what just happened well I, obviously they got the fourth sellout and i don't remember if it was archie moore or who it was that was brought in as a special referee that this something like this would never ever happen again but there's a, a classic example and of, then it didn't happen that's that's the important thing it didn't happen again didn't, because happen you know again, because no. they honored that stipulation and that's and and what you just illustrated was the perfect, a, a beautiful ref bump, a perfectly done ref bump is one of the hottest finishes in wrestling. But then guys saw it and they took it back to their own territories and they took the idea, the concept, but they didn't execute it maybe properly or with as much forethought or with carrying it through to the point of, you know, the guys carry it off on, on a stretch or whatever. And it started to be prostituted and, and all of a sudden, the referee started going down like the, you know, the ducks in the shooting gallery at the carnival for no reason, just because they remembered that, well, when they knocked the referee down, it sold out. Mm. Here's and that. that's, again, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of like you that, and I'm sure you experienced this running, you know, Smoky Mountain, that it, it's tempting to knock the referee down because then it, it opens up the possibilities of things that you could do. But then the problem is that it tends to be overdone. Uh, I was, uh, before our interview session up in New Jersey, I was, I was in Texas. And I was in the corner of a challenger for the, the, the trying to revive the NWA title. The champion was there. And at the end, they wanted me to get a pair of brass knuckles to the guy uh, that I was managing and he was going to try and hit the champion and end up the champion got him off and knocked him out and got disqualified. So the first thing they want to do is a referee bump. And I'm listening to all this. And I said, well, <laughs> I have an idea. Why, why don't we eliminate the referee bump? And they're all looking, well, how can we do that? And I said, well, when the heel went for the finish, what would have normally been his finish. And it was one, two and three quarters. And he just, the, the champion kicked out. The guy got up and he's screaming 
and I'm up on the apron, like starting through the ropes as if my, my man has won the title. So I'm, that gets me up on the apron. Now there's always plan B. So now the referee's got his back turned. I go in my pocket, pull out the pair of brass knucks, which my guy now sees over the shoulder of the referee, and I slid it underneath the top turnbuckle, took two or three steps back, and it only took a, an instant. And my guy then freed the referee and turned him around. He turned around. He said, what are you doing on the apron? I said, I don't know how you didn't count three just long enough for me to take the referee down the apron while my guy went and pulled the knucks out from underneath the top ring pad. Now he's set up. He's got the knucks. I get down, throws the guy in. The guy ducks, hits him, grabs the knuckles while you son of a gun turns off and the referee standing there watch him in a moment of anger. Cole cucks. My guy knocks him out, covers him. Referee's calling for the bell. You know, you did it right in front of me. So there are ways to do things, and it just requires um, some thought. And it was, again, a situation where we, we got to the same result without what would have been the easiest way is knocking down the referee, which is really unnecessary. That's always the, the, the thing is, is you are tempted to take the easy way, but the harder way actually looks better. and makes more sense if you do it properly. And, um, and you know, and that's, I will say one time I, I mentioned to Dusty in Greensboro, he, he called a finish for us and, and the road warriors. And I said, gosh, I said, Dusty, I said, Last last month we did that with the Fantastics or whoever. He said, "Ah, that's okay, kid. It was two different people. They won't notice." <laughs> but but <laughs> D- Dusty, uh, you know, people have talked about. Well, Jerry Lawler owned Memphis, and Vern Gagne owned Minneapolis. And I, I, when I mean own, I mean they. It was their territory. It was their town. It was their state. Whatever. Um, nobody in the United States. The Von Erichs in Texas. We could go on and on, but nobody ever owned people owned fans owned a territory like dusty Rhodes owned florida and he started out as a heel and his charisma and his athletic ability and i've said this many times you know a lot of people have seen dusty from the late 80s because vcrs were prevalent and pay-per-view and the national tv but when you saw dusty Rhodes in the late 60s early 70s he could move and what an athlete and the fire that he had and and the he was a ball of fire in the ring, making comebacks or getting heat or whatever, or taking bumps. And the people started falling in love with him just because his personality showed through, even when he was a heel, when he was a member of Gary Hart's stable. And then finally, 1974, they pulled the trigger with him and Pac Song, uh, and, and Gary Hart turned on on the dream, and and it he he cut the promo about being the American dream, the son of a plumber, and T.C. Lee, the old black man that used to work digging ditches with him, said, son, one of these days you're going to be something. And he created that, and you couldn't write that. A writer could not write that. He took shit from his real life, and he took shit that, that he thought of that would have been great if it was in his real life, and he blurred the two together, and he was more popular. He was a star in every city and state of Florida. And he was more popular. And, he, and than not to rest- interrupt you, but he's he's one of the few. Not a lot of guys had that kind of success in Florida, and then went to New York as a, a major attraction in Madison Square Garden, and enjoyed the same level of success. Exactly. So that, that's, that's he, he, he had translated every incredible everybody. talent. It's that it factor, that charisma factor that you can't teach somebody. You either got it yeah. or you don't have it, and he had it. And part of that was being an egotistical son of a bitch. Yes, I am. I am the American dream. I'm the greatest thing you ever seen, baby. And October yeah. 12th, by the way, is going to be, according to Alice Radley, who uh, we, we said this earlier, October 12th is Dusty's birthday, and it's going to be National Talk Like the Dream Day. Everybody got to talk like the dream on October 12th. But, I just and, think it's good fun, right? It's yeah. Fun. And, and, you know, and, 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 and once again, the promo, when he got on TBS, on Atlanta TV, when it first became a super station in the late 70s, I would go to my uncle's house in, way in the hills of East Tennessee. They had cable. When big cities didn't, they did. And, and I would watch the Georgia show and there would be dusty out there in that funky felt hat and those colorful tights and the robes. And he, he, he was over in New York. He was over in Atlanta. He was over in Florida and dusty as a wrestler, you know, he was mentioned in the same breath, basically in the late seventies, it was, it was dusty Rhodes, Ric Flair, Andre, the giant 
and uh, Bruno Sammartino, those were the, the biggest stars in, in, in the wrestling industry. And Dusty was able to, to take that and take what he had learned from Eddie Graham and, and apply it to a, a booking philosophy as well. And he made more money for the only serious competitor for Vince McMahon, Jim Crockett Promotions, than any other booker ever had. And they'd had some great bookers. Uh, but what what was it like? Because you got to spend a lot of time uh, in Florida in the late 70s, early 80s down there in that period of time where Dusty was transitioning from one of the top talents to to a, a booker. And, and then you got to work alongside him. You know, you were the detail guy. I always say the assistant booker is the guy with the good handwriting, right? And that takes <laughs> note. And because I did the same thing when you know in in Atlanta with Flair and and Kevin Sullivan, I was the obsessive note taker and had good handwriting. But um, you know, Dusty would just scratch some shit that you could barely read on a piece of paper. But when he would tell it to you verbally, it was the greatest goddamn television show you'd ever seen in your life. Yeah, it had money written all over it. Yeah. What what was what was it like being and, and plus you were stuck in you were the guy with good handwriting in between Eddie Graham and Dusty Rhodes that had to be a hell of a spot. Yeah, well, there's always, and I think this was the missing factor uh, at at the when it came to an end with uh, WCW in Atlanta because you you always had in in the New York territory. And, and and it passed down from generation to generation that no matter who was was uh, you know doing the, the the matchmaking or writing television or whatever, you always had a Vince McMahon in that area looking over their shoulder. In Florida, you had an Eddie Graham looking over their shoulder. Yeah. In Dallas, you had Fritz looking over their shoulder. In Amarillo, you had the Funks looking over their shoulder. These were people who wrestling was their life and they understood um the big picture though they understood that there's a longevity factor anybody can hot shot in any given week and produce phenomenal results the challenge is to have a plan of what week two week three week four and so forth and so on it's in 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 Turner, you did that was absent. You didn't have it, especially when Bischoff was in charge. Uh, and the inmates ran the asylum, and they drained it dry. And uh, the people in the upper echelon at the North Tower looked at some of the results and figured that all was well. And uh, it's just like all was well with the Titanic till it hit that iceberg. <laughs> and, 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 up to Lynn, it was a great cruise. Yes, um, it, was, it, it was a ship that couldn't be sunk. You know, well, it couldn't be sunk till it hit that iceberg and the hole was torn open. So um, we we did a we did a program with Lance Storm not long ago where he talked about in with the benefit of hindsight. Now, some of us had the benefit of foresight, but a lot of people still go back and say. The WWF Attitude Era. Boy, we wish it could be like that again. It was so great. And it well, there was there was consequences to the Attitude Era where everything was thrown out there. Just like when Lance said he worked for ECW and they broke all the rules and got over for breaking all the rules. And then once they broke all the rules, they figured out why they had rules to begin with. Because what do you follow it with? I, I I made the statement. Remember. In the old days when, when we would, there was no cell phones, video games, or internet service, or whatever, and we used to actually have to sit and entertain each other in these locker rooms. And the guys would come up with, well, we ought to have a match where one guy takes a hand grenade and sticks it up the other guy's ass and pulls the pin and blow in, you know, and you draw a circle around the ring, and wherever the spleen lands, you know, if whoever picks that wins a prize, or just some stupid thing. It's like the old Daffy Duck cartoon where he, he, he does the climactic part of his on stage show to try to top Bugs Bunny and he drinks the nitroglycerin and blows himself up and his ghost is floating up to heaven. And, and Bugs says, boy, that was a great trick. And Daffy says, yeah, but how do I follow it? If we would yeah, come up the, with these the business, ridiculous. The business, the business was most successful when we were like uh, uh, the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote. Yeah. And the, <laughs> the Wile E. Coyote was thinking of plans and devious things where he thought he had the Roadrunner trapped and 
you it never got tiresome it never it, got old because you never and, actually blew the, the the road runner never got blown up once the road no. runner's blown up what do you follow that with and and yeah. the attitude era ecw etc set a standard where what do you follow that with the answer is nothing you've reached the limit of human endurance you have numbed people to every angle or every injury or every particular bump or whatever and what do you follow it with and when the answer is you can't follow it that's when you've run your business into a dead end right and and when you're when you predicate something on violence it's it's kind of like the first time that somebody went through a table that people want wow the table split in half there were splinters everywhere well the you you did it the second week you did it the third week you got a reaction but not that yeah. reaction as you've already hinted at like you had the third the first week so now the idea comes well you know we stacked them up and put him through the table why don't we put two tables and you stack up two tables now you get that wild pop again and then two tables becomes three tables and then you pretty soon you got the table stacked so high that you can't do it in the ring. So you got to go to the back of the building and somebody has got to go up on the balcony and go through and down. Uh, but as and, you then you, out, and then you set them on fire. Limit. Once you, once you set the ring on fire and, and you brought out, and, you know, all, all of these uh, different tools when everything's predicated on violence and uh, on violence and you have two crazy people like uh, a Mick Foley and a Terry Funk that, uh, are willing to set each other on fire again you can only do that so many times and and and, that's well, and, and, and then also i remember and i'm not i'm not picking on him but sabu sabu started just breaking the tables after his match he just jumped off the top rope and break a table and i my first reaction was why is he mad at the furniture what has yeah. the furniture done to him but it, 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 getting back to where we were going with all of that though was that with with guys like Dusty who and the Funks and the people you talked about who lived the business and understood the business and the personalities and why that they were in conflict with another strong personality was what drew and you had to have violence between them but you didn't have like you said violence for violence's sake amongst guys who if they weren't invested in the personalities involved, and I don't even use the word character because I think that's, once again, that's scripted, choreographed bullshit. It's personalities. Dusty Rhodes was not a character. Dusty Rhodes, it, I mean, he was a character in the sense my mother used to say, boy, what a character he is. But he didn't have a character. It was Dusty. It was Flair. Yes. It was, a, it was and, Terry and Funk. This, it was whoever. This, this is a, a thought that I have, too, that there are people who – do other things in entertainment, whether it's sitcoms or whether it's uh, great, great movies or whatever out in Hollywood that have talent doing other things that, that I, I don't possess that kind of talent. And they've been drawn into our business and I'm sure that they've done some good things, but I can't imagine that anyone could, no matter how much talent they have, write down something and print it out as to what they think a dusty Rhodes would say and hand it to him and say, here, go out and deliver it. Yeah. Because as you has pointed out what dusty made so successful was when he spoke, it was dusty speaking from his heart and being dusty. Somebody else, no matter how much talent that they have, they, they can get it to a certain point, but, only Dusty can be Dusty, and I think Robert, that's Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro could not be Dusty Rhodes because you just couldn't. And did I ever tell you? Did I ever tell you the closed captioning thing? I, I, I actually, when remember in the ninety early nineties when Dusty was doing uh, color commentary on the Saturday Night Show, I checked into a hotel somewhere, and the closed captioning had been left on on the television from the previous person in the room, right? And it was it was one of the computerized things where it you know is I don't know I don't think somebody was actually there typing it it was computerized or whatever but the point is I could understand whoever the play by play guy was it, it was coming across exactly correct but then Dusty would speak <laughs> and the closed captioning was just it wasn't even words it was just gibberish because they couldn't but but when you listen to Dusty say it God damn it was cool it was great shit but it it was yeah. untranslatable. And that's, that's what's missing 
with guys who are allowed to be themselves, which these days the guys aren't. They aren't allowed to find themselves, and if they do find themselves, they're not allowed to be themselves because the writers have to justify their salary. Uh, but And, you know, talk about guys who are allowed to be themselves. We got to talk about the horsemen because when you had Ric Flair, Tully Blanchard, Arn Anderson, and whether it be Lex Luger on the other side or Barry Windham, which was my, you know, personal uh, favorite four, or, or Ole Anderson, and believe me, Ole was legitimate straight up and down the board and one of the great promos of all time and could make you believe even the boy, the boys hated Ole because he was his sense of humor was so sharp and he could verbally eviscerate you while he was ribbing you, but he would have that straight face where you didn't even you even the smartest guys didn't know he was ribbing or not. Those guys, you believed their life was wrestling. They knew it in and out. They knew what got themselves over, and they knew how to get other people over when they worked with them. You know, I. Uh, was looking on uh, Facebook the other day and somebody posted something and, and it was a question presented to me that they posted an interview and, and the question they wanted to know was what did I regard this as the greatest interview that I ever did? Well, it was like eight minutes and I thought I didn't, I didn't remember. And so I, I watched it and all the horsemen were out there and it was the breakup of, the horseman with Luger and it was a bunkhouse stampede and the winner of the bunkhouse stampede was going to get a shot at flair. And so all of us, you know, we're going to control the situation so that, you know, one of us won it so that the match with flair would never take place because we were never going to challenge flair, even though we would have the right to, because we would have won the, the bunkhouse stampede. Well, it ended up the story was that, it got down to it was it was Arn, it was Tully, it was Luger, and I was still in there, and I was there kind of just not really thinking that I ever had a chance to win the thing, but I was in there kind of like just to be close to the action to help orchestrate things if it became necessary. Well, when it got down to that, somebody had the idea, and I think i I mean I might have said, "Oh, you know." I never in my wildest dreams ever thought that I could be in the rec record book as a winner of a bunkhouse stampede. And the other guy, and Tully got a big smile, Arn got a big smile, and they said, we are going to make this happen. And so <laughs> Arn went over the top rope, eliminated himself. Tully went over the top rope, eliminated himself. They looked at Luger, kind of gave him the thumb. Okay, big guy, big guy. Yeah, come on. Get going, you know, and I'm already thinking about, I'm already, you know, it's it's already happened in my mind, you know. And With I'm that thinking, classic oh, this look is, that you used to get on oh, your face this, where this you is, just look up to this, the heavens and glory oh, in it. Oh, this is beyond anything that I ever could have dreamed. And, and, and Luger comes up behind, just grabs me by the seat of the pants and tosses me like last week's garbage over the top rope. Well, that the interview started out was where Luger had said something about the, you know, the plan was flawed. And, and so I started out and carried probably a good part of a good part of the interview, three minutes, maybe longer where, you know, the, the, the plan was not flawed. The plan was perfect. You know, when the green Bay Packers went into the locker room with Vince Lombardi and he said, this is the, this is the game plan. Nobody raised their hand and said, well, you know, and questioned the plan. And so the, the the flaw was not was not the plan, and then we went and showed the actual finish of the match, and when it came back to the finish of the match, Arn stepped in and basically reiterated what I had and basically said the Luger was done, it was strictly a selfish thing, that uh, that this was something that they wanted to do for me, and when the f interview was concluded. The only two people that spoke were myself and Arn. And here's Tully Blanchard standing out there and Ric Flair, one of the greatest promo guys of all time, standing out there in an eight minute segment. And again, there was, uh, you know, probably three minutes or so of the match that was in between. I thought to myself, boy, there is part of why we were successful because 
that particular situation was a situation that I could emotionally carry and tell the story. And then Arn came in at the end and reinforced it. Tully never said a word because he didn't need to. Flair just stood there with that glare on his face. And I thought, here's one of the greatest champions of all time in an eight minute segment, stood out there and never said a word. Well, and, th- you know, that goes back to knowing what, knowing not only how to get the guys over that they're working with, but knowing what gets them over and, and knowing that was the perfect story to tell Luger would have been the one because you were closer in the fans' eyes. You were closer to Tully. You were closer to Arn. You were closer to Flair. But Luger was the new guy on the block, and he was a bit of a big head. And he would have been the one, if any of them was, to 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 break with uh, the plan. And right. it, as a matter of fact, the, the we talked about this a little bit on the the Back to the Territories release from Kayfabe Commentaries, uh, the Midnight Express and Tully and Arn program that unfortunately got cut short when. Tully and Arn went north, but um, we made, the Midnight and I made more money on payoffs uh, per match for that brief series with Tully and Arn and yourself than anybody we worked with in the NWA for a five-year period except for the Rock and Roll Express. The houses were that big. They had held that match back. The people had never seen it. They wanted to see it. But what we did with it was the people could believe that this young, obnoxious, rich kid prick and this older, more pompous, arrogant, experienced manager would naturally grate on each other's nerves that we played on the fact that, that we mentioned and people had seen it because they'd seen them ride together and they'd seen them out together. That Bob Eaton and Arn Anderson were best friends. And we fleshed it out that, that their children played together. And everybody believed that Tully Blanchard was an obnoxious prick that nobody in the locker room liked, except probably for Ric Flair, which was, it was very, very true. And that naturally Stan Lane wasn't going to like him. And, and Tully Blanchard played on the fact that Stan Lane was an arrogant pretty boy who was only concerned with however many women he could get after the matches. And that the horsemen traveled first class and the Midnight Express stayed at the Motel 6 because we were saving our money. It, it, was, it was all real. And then finally, when Bobby blew up at Tully, not Arn, but Tully, telling him he was a piece of trash and to shut up, and Bobby never spoke, much less getting mad in somebody's face. They bought it. These guys are really mad at each other, and everything they're saying is true, so it must hold that they really want to fight each other because they're telling us the truth. And that was the whole key to it. And you couldn't, somebody else could not make that shit up. It had to be the guys involved. It wasn't complicated. It, it, what, they could sit there and watch and they didn't want to get up and go to the fridge and, and, and get something cold or go to the, but they, they, they wanted to sit there and hang on every word that was said because it was so true to life. Probably everybody sitting there watching could relate to what they were seeing happen with us because it was, it was true to life. And that was part of the secret of our success is that we, we just, we, you know, we, we emulated true life of personalities and families and friends and, um, and we were all our own individual character successful as a unit and yet we weren't cookie cutters we were all different just the same as you D- dust, out dusty you were or, different. dusty or the booker or the matchmaker would give you okay here's an angle to do the horsemen are going to jump bobby in the locker room while stan and jim are at the ring but the promos were up to us to talk about that incident and what we were going to do about it because that's the, that's a, a great matchmaker a great booker knows how to take talent and put them in conflict and then let them make the most out of it because it was up to us as to whether we made money or not as as a result so we were naturally going to put as much thought into it as possible and also we had so much pride and so much ego we didn't want to be shown up by the other guys so we were pressing it's like the it's like the thoroughbred racehorse that the owner of the racehorse knows that he's got this thoroughbred horse that uh can win the race can can win the roses at the end but he handpicks the jockey who trains with that horse that understands that horse that knows that he can't get out in front of the pack and run full, full speed ahead the whole way and have any get any gas left at the end. And the good jockey knows his horse knows when to lay back, 
where to position himself so he's not in harm's way of being bumped and when he's ready to make his move. And then the owner has faith in that jockey at the right moment to make his move and, and, and run for the finish line. Wrestling business is, is no different. And like you're saying, we, we, we were all proven successes because it was in our blood. It was our life. And we took pride in what we did and our track records of success spoke for themselves. And when you take that much talent and have it come together and, and kind of feed off each other, motivate each other, uh, you know, Arn would say we weren't all in the same match every night. We weren't all, uh, he would go out sometimes on an earlier match and without saying so he would go out and leave everything in that ring and when he came through that dressing room door he never uttered the words okay follow that one because he didn't have to yeah we knew what he did what he accomplished and what he left out there because we weren't blind and so that then set a bar while okay (laughs) arn arn no wow how are we going to follow that? That's a challenge, but now we're going to rise to that challenge. And the fans with the Midnight Express, with the Rock and Roll Express, with the Horsemen, respected us because when they bought a ticket, they knew, regardless of how many people were in the house, where the arena was, they knew the effort that they were going to get from us. And over a period of time, we had to earn that respect and we sure as hell did earn that respect. And that's why we had the longevity that we did. And I tell you, I, I got to, I know we're, we're running low on time because the people's commutes are not as long as, as, uh, as our, uh, we could talk all day, but I got to ask you one more thing. You mentioned people didn't want to get up from the TV and get a cold one talking about going to the refrigerator and getting a cold one. I'm not going to reveal your age, JJ. you you, you look ever youthful and you never change, but, after traveling with Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard, and Barry Windham in some cases, after traveling, not only working with them in the arenas, but traveling with them outside and partying with them, how are you still living? How are you still breathing? That, that, that's a question that I can't answer, and I'm, I somehow look myself, and, and you know, I joke with friends, and I, and I, and I, I say is trying to keep up with those guys, Lord only knows how many brain cells I killed in the process. And it's amazing that I could still carry on a reasonably intelligent conversation with you as I, I think we're trying to do right now. I, I just, I don't know. Just, do you think um, it is? Maybe I, I, can, I can say that in Charlotte, he sat with, up with us for until a four in the morning uh, oh, with a bunch God, of young, young people. You, yeah, you, you I, were, I, it was I amazing. Wanted get, I wanted to get some sleep and I had a friend who I had seen from Huntsville who I promised to have a drink with, and I looked at my watch and I said, I need to get some sleep. I'm not <laughs> used to staying up late. There's no and sleeping at Fan Fest. <laughs> yeah, I got one foot outside the, the bar room door. I mean, bar room, there wasn't a doorway, but the, you know, the exit. And there were a group of people that were there. And it just started as casual conversation and asking a question. And then one question went to another. And all of a sudden, you know, I I don't know how many hours that, that we stood there in conversation, but I looked around and the bar was closed. Everything was cleaned up. <laughs> the lights were turned out and we were still talking and we went to, to sit down. And at the end of the night, uh, my friend from Huntsville ordered some Domino's pizza and he and I were sitting there looking at each other at five o'clock in the morning, which is the latest that I've gone to bed in probably since the last time I was on the road with Flair, but um, the, the the whole thing comes down to Jim. The one thing that you and I share is yes, we've had success, but we, we have a passion for and a, and, a, and a level of pride for what we did and for what we accomplished. And we know that we had a lot of help and we were surrounded by phenomenal talent, but we love what we were doing. And that's what happened to me in Charlotte, that it, it was conversation with young people. And all of a sudden, they, 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 without me realizing it, you know, they were picking my brain. They were asking me questions. And, 
apparently the answers triggered more questions and 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 then and then time just blew by but well that i i kind of had the same thing except my thursday night q and a the traditional late night time slot i was upstairs waiting for that to happen and and only of course, Ole Anderson was sitting in the lobby, and I started talking to him, and I, I, I was started sending people down to go see if they're still going so I can ask Ole some more questions. But I, I got to ask you one thing before we go because you touched on it, and I don't want to ruin anybody's marriage, although I have a feeling that probably everybody's uh, traded since the 80s. Uh, what was the wildest night you ever had with the horseman on the road? <laughs> <laughs> um, or is there oh is there still possibly uh, uh, some pending litigation over that that you can't comment on? I remember we we went to Vegas and were there for three nights and and flew to the West Coast towns and, and then back in a in a private plane and we were staying at Caesar's Palace and Flair had a suite and there was a round bed with a with a mechanical curtain that would go around in a circle and it was kind of like a veil that you could see through. And I remember I left for a while, I actually went and, uh, and, and sat at a bar and, and smoked a cigar with Dusty and then went back to the room. And as I sit there, I watched all this food sitting there. I mean, there was Caesar salad, there was lobster, there was shrimp, uh, there were fur coats and, and uh, people that would be accustomed to wearing fur coats uh, <laughs> all over the place. And it just, it was, um, you know, it was, God, I, 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 I don't know. It was, uh, not it was too, Caesar's I'm palace not saying that happened every night, but, uh, <laughs> and, and, and a, a second time we were in Honolulu, Hawaii, and it's a true story. And we went to a, a restaurant and Flair ordered Dom Perignon. And it was one, we'll bring another, bring another, bring another. And pretty soon there were seven bottles of Dom Perignon uh, on, the, uh, uh, on our table. And in, this was when uh, oh, Tom Selleck was the role that he played uh, in Hawaii. Magnum P.I. Uh, Magnum P.I. He walked into the restaurant and sat down <laughs> to have a meal and he waved to us and, and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, a, you know, where we made a big fuss of it, waved to him, happy to see him. And, and he ordered a, a bottle of Dom Perry on and they said, there is none. Those guys over there and drank the place dry. And he came over with a big smile on his face and there was a, a bottle that wasn't completely empty. And we got him a glass and poured him and drank him. But those were the stories that, uh, it's, you know, it's you can't make them up. It happened. I remember in 1987, the the annual NWA convention used to be that NWA convention was all the promoters that belonged to the NWA would meet in Las Vegas or meet somewhere, and and they would they would have discussions of business, and they'd nominate a champion that year if they were going to replace him or keep him or whatever, and they'd do a lot of business. But then by 1987, pretty much the NWA was Jim Crockett Promotions. So. He announced to all of us, and I'm sure you remember, that we were going to go to St. Martin for the NWA meeting, and he was going to fly like his 20 top guys uh, out there for three days. To We didn't run shows, just had some rest and relaxation. And the Midnight and I went, and you guys, the Horsemen went, and et, et cetera, Dusty, all the top baby faces were there. And we get to the resort, and the first day they have a bus come and pick us up at the, you know, at, at the uh, central – office area and take us over to this meeting room where they had pitchers of water and they had a big blackboard and they had all these notepads and pens spread out and everything. And Jimmy convened the meeting and basically said, okay. And he talked for like two or three minutes. And that was the excuse to write the, the whole trip off as a tax expense. And we called the guy back and the guy came back in. He said, do you need something? He said, yeah, we need the, we need the shuttle to take us all back to the office. The meeting he, said, has been he said, the meeting's adjourned. He said, when are you starting again? He said, we're not. That was it. And we just hang, hang out in St. Martin for three more days and go fishing yeah. and boating and whatever. But uh, uh, and this, this is a true story. St. Martin is half French, half Dutch. And on the French side, on the north side of the island, is a nude beach. And well, so, okay, you know, do as the natives do. So Flair, <laughs> myself, and... Uh, 
a, a woman who I was not married to, who later became my third wife, we decide to go up to uh, the the nude beach. So we go up there and we're, 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 you know, and it's, it was kind of like you started at one point, the beach was like a big horseshoe and then you almost came back to where you started from. And so we're walking along and, uh, you know, <laughs> there's naked people everywhere. And Flair and I are talking and we said, well, you know, everybody else is doing it. It's not that big a deal. <laughs> and it's like, well, well, if you do it, I'll do it. Well, I said, okay, well, all right, you sure? Yeah. Okay, well, you go first. So I remember taking off all of my clothes and putting them on the sand in, in a nice little pile. And my wife-to-be had already swam out, swam out, you know, and I jumped in the water and went out, and I got out there far enough. And as I turned back around, I watched Ric Flair neatly picking up my clothes putting him under one arm and waving goodbye to me and back down the island he goes. <laughs> so See, now I, I would have guessed that Ric Flair water. would have been the first one naked. Yeah, <laughs> From everything I've heard about Ric Flair. <laughs> yeah, not when, not when everybody much, else is, though. Ah, it's always much, at the wrong time. <laughs> he wouldn't meet, need any prompting either. But in this case, it was a chance for him to get me, and boy, he got me good. So I had to walk the whole beach in all of my glory till I got to the other end. And there were my clothes and a nice neat mile. Uh, I, <laughs> I can't stop only, that story. The only time that Rick would take his clothes off is if everybody else had their clothes on. And, and, and if he was walking up uphill from the Marriott to the, to the Howard Johnson's in Washington, D.C. In, in about two feet of snow with only a fur coat and a $28,000 championship belt on with a woman who had only the fur coat and no championship belt on so he could <laughs> knock on all the guys' doors. But that's another story. And we're way over time. J.J., thank you very much. Oh, uh, Jim, thank, 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 thank you. I, I, I cherish these times. Uh, uh, you know, we shared so much of it together and the time just flies by. And, uh, uh, you know, I hope the fans that uh, enjoy listening to us, uh, if nothing else, we're entertaining each other. And I hope it's more than just the two of us. I, I Hopefully it will be. Well, at least Alice got a tickle out of it. And, and hopefully the, uh, the assembled cult of Cornet listeners do too, because at least that's folks, that's why we miss this stuff. Cause that's the way it used to be. And you look at the way it is now and you see there's a little bit of a difference. And on that, I will bid JJ Dillon a good day.